Picture this, you finally made it to the gym or out on a walk, or if you're a parent, you're on the sidelines watching your kid giving 100% on the soccer field. And then, bam, 20 minutes in, down arrow on the CGM or the shaky feeling happens and the low glucose hits. It's so frustrating and so common for so many people with diabetes to be rudely interrupted by lows during exercise. Whether you're new to T1D or have been at it for years, figuring out how to stay in range during exercise is a really big learning curve and it takes a lot of patience. You might wonder if it's all even worth it or think about avoiding activity if you're worried about lows or surprise glucoses. In this video, we're going to talk about when and why lows can happen during activity and what we can do about it. Hi everyone, welcome to Type 1 Diabetes World, where we give you the practical strategies to successfully manage T1D. People of all ages with type 1 absolutely can be physically active, whether that's jumping on a trampoline, taking a walk, climbing mountains, or playing professional sports. Though it might take some time to discover your individual patterns, and of course every day will be a little different, you can definitely do this. Let's talk about why we often see low blood glucoses with activity. Exercise generally tends to lower glucose because it makes our cells more receptive to and sensitive to insulin. Muscles pull in and use up more glucose both while they are active and afterward when they are recovering and rebuilding. So, any insulin on board in the body during exercise, both long-acting basal and rapid-acting mealtime insulin, will be more effective and powerful. It's likely to drop the glucose further and faster than when the body is at rest. If we don't reduce that insulin or add carbohydrates to buffer it, we'll have more than we need and glucose will drop. Unless, of course, it doesn't. There's a big exception here. You may actually see high or rising glucoses with short, intense bursts of exercise, like lifting weights or sprinting, or during competitions when you've got a case of the butterflies. That's a whole different conversation. Next, let's talk about when we might expect to see lows around exercise. Hypoglycemia can happen during, shortly after, or up to 24 hours after exercise. We'll go over each of these scenarios. Lows often happen during activity, usually within the first 45 minutes. This is the one that we tend to fear most and are most frustrated by. Basal insulin plays some role in these, but the biggest driver here is having too much rapid-acting insulin on board, also sometimes called active insulin. Remember how this kind of insulin works. An injection or a pump bolus given for carbs or a glucose correction will peak about an hour after it's given and typically lasts about four to five hours. So, if activity happens within two hours of a dose, it's much more likely that the glucose will drop significantly, often below target. Remember, exercise makes the body cells more sensitive to insulin, and that increased sensitivity lasts even after activity stops. For example, glucose might drop after the next mealtime dose or next correction dose because that insulin will hit harder. We can also expect to see delayed lows quite a bit later after exercise because that sensitivity to insulin may last for up to 24 hours. This one is extra important to know about because it can be a cause of overnight hypoglycemia. Especially with afternoon or evening exercise, the body can become more sensitive not only to evening mealtime doses, but also the overnight basal insulin. So this really increases the chance that glucose might drop during sleep. Delayed lows overnight can also happen from lower intensity activities that last several hours. Walking around all day on vacation is a great example. And even with those high intensity sports we talked about that might spike glucose at first, glucose can still drop many hours later as muscles recover. So what can we do to minimize these lows? Here are a few things that might help. First of all, start safely. Set yourself up for success by knowing where your glucose is before you begin. The latest expert guidelines tell us that if glucose is under 90, it's best to take some carbohydrate and wait for glucose to rise before starting activity. Ideal range for starting is about 120 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, and if glucose is over 270 with significant ketones, or if there's been a severe low within the past 24 hours, it's safest to postpone. Good idea to check in with your team in those situations too. If you can monitor glucose during activity and afterwards, and definitely at bedtime, you'll have a lot more opportunity to head off delayed lows as well as starting to capture some trends. Another tactic that can be helpful is to be mindful of when you last gave insulin for food or correction. 
If you find yourself about to start an activity within two hours of your last injection or bolus, you'll probably need to take extra carbohydrate to buffer that circulating insulin. If you can plan ahead for it, you can also try reducing the insulin dose for the meal or snack you're having before the activity. If you're using a pump, you also have the option to temporarily decrease your basal rate to decrease the amount of insulin in your system. Or, for the newer hybrid closed loop systems, set a temporarily higher target glucose. For best results, try to make those changes about an hour and a half before activity. If you disconnect the pump or suspend insulin or set that higher target right at the start, that's often too late because the full strength basal from the last couple of hours is still working. Okay, so you might be thinking, thanks for all this vague advice, but how much should we reduce insulin? Back to our expert guidelines. These tell us that we can try reducing by anywhere from 25 to 75% for mealtime doses before activity and about 50 to 80% for pump basal rates. So either a little or a lot. The reason these recommendations are so broad is, of course, that everyone's T1D is different, but more specifically, there are a handful of variables that are gonna determine the best starting point for you or your child. Even after we factor these in, there's still always going to be some trial and error. So the next helpful tactic is dig into those details. As you're out enjoying activities, here are a few more things to take note of. What kind of exercise and how intense? How long did it last? What time of day was it? How much carbohydrate and what kind specifically was eaten in the few hours prior? Were there any lows in the previous 24 hours? Is this a frequent activity or brand new? Is there stress or excitement about this activity? For example, is it a competition or just a practice? Obviously, it's really helpful to write all this down, which I know takes more work. The good news is that most people do have a predictable pattern and with some time and focus, you really can find it. The next tactic is to plan for overnight. If activity happens in the afternoon or evening, it's reasonable to consider a couple different tactics. Reducing your evening mealtime and snack time doses, decreasing your basal insulin dose, or decreasing pump basal rates. The research tells us that for pumps, decreasing basals by 20% for six hours starting at bedtime is a good starting point for avoiding hypoglycemia overnight. Of course, for all of these potential insulin adjustments, you'll want to talk to your own diabetes care team to refine the best and safest plan for you. Speaking of talking to your team, partnering with them in a proactive way is our last tactic. How can we make this a successful conversation? For starters, just bring it up. We know from research that conversations about exercise aren't happening often enough or in enough detail to be helpful. So try to come prepared with as much detailed information as you can, all that stuff you've been writing down in all your spare time. If you can come to a visit saying, okay, every time I play basketball and I've dosed for a 70 gram carb dinner about an hour before, I seem to drop at least 50 points in the first 20 minutes. So can you help me decide how much to reduce that bolus? It's a lot better conversation than just Ugh, I always go low with exercise. When you've captured the nitty gritty details, you're going to be able to come up with a really strong plan. Finally, as you're working through this, know that there are going to be some great days and some days where glucose goes out of range in spite of your best efforts. The error part of trial and error is no fun, but hang in there. This is really tough stuff and you can do it. Here are a few last safety tips. Be sure to carry fast acting glucose always bring your glucose meter or wear CGM, and it's a great idea to wear medical identification. Okay, let's recap. Exercising with T1D can take some extra prep and planning, but it's doable and absolutely worth it. Lows may very well happen with activity, during, after, or overnight. The amount of rapid acting insulin on board during exercise has a huge influence on glucose and the risk for lows. Your diabetes team can help support you in planning for activity, especially if you are proactive in asking for guidance and taking note of all of your individual variables. That's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. If you're finding it helpful, please remember to like and subscribe. We'll see you next time.